This is week two of Coney History, AC 537. Last week I showed you the uh, programme for the first three weeks. The readings changed slightly. Um, the fourth reading is now one that looks at the uh, Guelph Ghibelline problems. Uh, to be set medieval Italy and particularly the 13th century Battle of Monteperti between the Guelph of Florence and the Ghibelline of Siena. Guelph were the followers of the Pope, the Ghibelline were the followers of the Holy Roman Emperor. And this schism between the two uh, groups had a major impact on life in the region for several, several years. Its relevance to accounting lies in what happened in terms of control over the banking. When uh, the Pope appointed CNEs bankers, Papal bankers. It was out of expediency, convenience, if you like. It was the appropriate choice because of location, apart from anything else. I think papal bankers gave the CNEs bankers great access, or access to great funds and resources, which they used. And you've seen the detail in what you've read. That happened in the 1220s. And around the same time, they were also appointed official bankers for the fairs of Champagne, which were the major international fairs in Europe. And that paid Florentine bankers who took their place in the last quarter of the 13th century as papal bankers. And they took their place as the main bankers at the fairs of Champagne around about the same time. And thereafter, the Florentine bankers dominated European finance for several centuries. If I look at several things so far, and what I'm going to do today is just give you a bit of understanding or depth of understanding of the things that you need to be aware of when you're looking at this subject. I'm going into some detail on some of the artefacts that have been covered in the articles that you've been reading. So speculative history is something that it's almost unnecessary to use the word speculative because all history is speculative. It doesn't matter how far back you go, whether it's um, a week or a thousand years. You going to find that you don't know everything. You can never be 100% sure. So what you have to do is take all the evidence available to you and use it as best as you can. And in using it, you try and make sure that you make appropriate sense of it. Now the way that we deal with this issue of not being able to know everything is we try and fill in the gaps. So we take the evidence that we've got whether that's physical evidence, contextual evidence, whatever type of evidence, and we try and fit it together in a way that creates a picture that it makes sense, that's consistent with what the evidence is. It's like you're trying to make a jigsaw. You haven't got all the pieces, but you can, by looking at the shapes of the um, parts of each piece that's connect into other parts. We can work out where each piece should go and then we're just left with the gaps. And from that incomplete jigsaw we can deduce or induce what the picture represents and what's in it. But wherever there's a piece missing we're having to make some assumptions so we can't see the detail, but we can see what would have made sense if it was in there. And that's what historical research is all about. 
And in doing that, historians have to choose what to what to use. You may have 20 different pieces of evidence. Some point in one direction, some point in others, some, some point in the same direction. And you've got to pick the ones that go together best. Or if you find there's a complete mismatch, you then have to re-examine what you got and drill down deeper into that evidence to see if there's anything that can give you some greater clarity. And that might help you to then use it. At all times, you've got to set things in context. Addressing the inconsistencies and making sure that what you come with the conclusions you arrive at are consistent with that evidence and valid on that basis. And this is an opportunity to re-emphasise what I said last time. Context is vital. I already showed you the first of those two statements last last time. When you read evidence of the past and in accounting history research, when you look at the primary sources, the original documents, that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be reading. You've got to be able to read the language it's written in. That's the first thing. And that's a problem in itself. But when you're looking at these documents, you have to think about what was it that gave rise to its existence? What was it that it was there to serve? Why was it done? It goes back to the question I asked last time. Why do people keep accounts? What was the purpose of keeping them? And if I find out what that is, you need to look around, think outside the box, try and identify contextual factors that might explain why these things were done. For example, you might discover that there was a law passed in Florence in 1326 saying we're going to have, um, we're going to charge a tax based on people's wealth and we're going to make everyone report on their wealth in 1327. So you might have found, if that was the case, that if that there was more documentation relating to financial status of citizens in 1327 in Florence that survived than in any other year before it, or in the several years that follow it. And there was such a tax. And a census was taken in 1327, which involved merchants and others providing statements of their wealth. Abstracted in many cases from their business records. So you look at the context, they might give you an explanation as to why things were done and what something is there for. The other crucial thing to know, remember and to know at all times is sources. There are two main types of sources. Primary sources, which are original documents, like the ledger, or a journal, or a day book, or, a, or just a notebook. It might be 600 years old. Or maybe a piece of paper. Whatever it is, primary, the original source. That's the best source. Because from that, you can be sure that you can reassure yourself that you're using the right information. Whereas if you use a secondary source, it's a possibility the second the person who compiled the secondary source made a mistake or missed something out. Remember, history is speculative. So people select what they include. Now, if someone is taking a, an account ledger from 1400 and has transcribed, written out all the account entries, and then translated them into English. What guarantee have you got that the translation is right? That the transcription that was done first was right? And that nothing was missed out? And nothing was added in by mistake? The only way you can reassure you on those is to go and look at the original. 
But original sources, primary sources, can be scarce, and they are in the 13th century. The history that's written is affected not only by what sources you have, but how you use those sources. And as I've said more than once in the last few minutes, when you're doing historical work, you select what to use in a source. There's several examples that, that you will find, if you look for them, in accounting history literature, where the presentation of information from uh, an old account book has been modernised to make it easier to read. Which is excellent, it's, it's useful, but it's also ahistorical because it's changing the way something is presented and that changes how you interpret it, it changes how you view it and it may bias you towards thinking it's for a particular purpose when in fact it was for something totally different. So for example if you go and look at um, some of the publications by Raymond de Rover, who was a Belgian-American uh, business historian active between roughly 1935 and before his death in the early 1970s. You'll find that he's done this routinely with um, material from a large international merchant, international wholesale merchants business, account books. And he would present information as if it is costing information in a costing report. He'd, he'd provide information drawn from the ledger um, that he, he describes as a, as a profit loss account or an income statement or a balance sheet. When in actual fact in the original document they're not presented in that way at all and they were not intended to be balance sheets or income statements or cost statements. And that obviously affects people's understanding. It also affects the understanding of the person who's done that. And if another thing about sources is when you look at sources, you might think, ah, that's interesting. So you start uh, looking at this account book. And you've noticed that it appears that the um, merchant is recharging customers for the costs of delivering the goods that he's selling to him from his supplier. And it's been done using a flat rate percentage because in all the entries you're looking at, you're seeing the same percentage added on, but it's not labeled as such, it's just extra costs being charged to the customer or additions to the selling price. So you start looking at that and then you begin to wonder if I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm, I've worked out that this is probably what's being done, is there any evidence that this was common practice at that time? So you go off and start looking for that. You're no longer interested in that book you started looking at. You're now interested in the theme of recharging indirect expenses because that's effectively what these were because if you, if you buy in um, 200 metres of cloth and you're selling 40 metres and you're recharging the customer your cost of uh, receiving those goods the delivery costs you're only going to be able to charge the customer 20% um, of what the, the cloth charges for delivery were because that's the equivalent proportion of the total receipt of cloth so you've now gone off and you start looking for this thing about uh, recharging uh, indirect costs to customers. And you start on a completely different project. So that's what this is about. Source of setting a new direction. You might also see a reference in a, in a source to a person. And you recall that having seen the same person mentioned in various places elsewhere, in other things that you've seen, maybe in what you've read, maybe in, uh, in 
in another original source. And that sets you wondering as to what, how the particular business that, whose account we're looking at relates to that individual and how that individual relates to all the other businesses with which that individual had some transactions. So you end up doing some network analysis to show how the merchants all worked with each other or how we interacted with each other. Which is a completely different direction from the one you started off, which was just looking at an account book to see how the business was and to try and work out whether it was making a profit or loss. And sources are often misused, they're often underused, and they're often ignored. They're ignored because they're not they don't fit into the the model of the world that the historian is constructing. They're not directly relevant, so they're missed out. But they can also be missed out because the historian doesn't understand them, which is not necessarily a valid approach. They're often misused by um, selectively picking bits from them out of context and then presenting them as if they are in context. And they may well be underused because you can't read them properly you can't translate them properly. So basically what that typically what would hear would happen here is you might see read something that has an image from an old account book in it. But the image is not clear. And there's very little discussion about it, even though it's clearly a page out of a ledger with a lot of a lot of lines of text in it. And all you get is a, is a is a statement that this is an example of a page from a ledger, with no more, uh, no more analysis than that. So underusing the resources. And if you find you haven't got primary sources for what you want, you have to go to secondary sources. So, for example, in the case of the fragments from twelve eleven, they can no longer be read, but they were transcribed in eighteen eighty seven, and uh, the secondary source that was generated at that time, the printed transcription, is all we've got. And we need to assume that it was correct. That is problematic because in the case of the period we're looking at, there was a, a habit which dates back to, to the time before printing, which obviously this was, because it's the 13th century, not the, the 15th century. Printing started in the 1450s. There was a habit, or, or it, was just a, it was just done, that you abbreviated everything. It was like everything was written in shorthand. It meant you could take dictation. It meant you could... Um, write things down quickly. So a lot of abbreviations and it's easy to misread an abbreviation and to misunderstand it and put the wrong thing down. So the secondary sources that are based on the primary sources may have problems when those abbreviations have been dealt with. And they may have missed something out because it's a, it's they find it difficult to read. So they just miss it out. It's blank. There's no there's no indication there was anything taken that wasn't included. And you'll find that in many cases when people revisit something that has been transcribed or translated, revisit the original, that is very different. You'll see a very clear example of that uh, when we get on to looking at Pacioli's work later in the, in the course. Now, just to go over things very briefly, as I said last time, here's single entry. Um, there is no indication there of the contra entry. So then we have double entry bookkeeping, and this is what it looks like, as I showed you last time. So you have the, the account to be debited, there's a debit, there's a deduct, and the first line. And then at the very end, um, you have mention of where the, the contra entry is. And again, this is also shown to you last week, this is the original, unreadable, um, 
excerpt from the bank ledger from 1211, which you've now read about in considerable detail. And these are the accounts that I've shown you in the article that you've just read. Seven of the accounts drawn from that ledger. They uh, all give you enough information to be able to identify the debits and the credits. And you'll see that in every case where there is an entry there, there's a debit and there is a credit. And a person is identified for the debit and a person is identified for the credit and so on. Or, or something is identified, like cash. What I'm going to show you now is how we got to the point of having that translation. Now this is from the original transcription at the top here uh, of the first entry and this is from column 5 in a piece of parchment uh, in the name of God Amen San Brocco which is the fair in Bologna where these transactions were taking place in 1211 And you have, if you compare the, the transcription to the translation to English, you'll see that I've left the names as they were. In effect. You'll see that it's all written in one paragraph. And the way to uh, deal with it is you can see where the sentences, first sentence has been ended by the in the transcription. Pelo mecato san broccoli. That's for the san broccoli fair. The next part says, si più stano, which is if late. And that's implying that this will be an interest charge. Will be at four denari per libra, per month. And then you have a colon in the transcription. And that the next part, Sili non pagasi, if he does not pay. And then you've got, si non promise de pagare angiolini bolognini gali agiang. And if he does not pay, Angolin Bolognini Galigayo promised to pay us. And then you see the, the two letters TT with a full stop. That's testamento, um, witnessed. And then the name Compagna Avenelli e Bella Calza. And at that time, there was no. Uh, distinction between a U and a V, but that was a V, Avanelli. If you look at Compagno, it's an example of the sort of things that were problematic. The transcription shows that there was an abbreviation of the, of the word Compagno. There's a line above the O, which indicates that something's missing, and in that situation it would be an M. And then you've got the second uh, entry in the account which begins with the word item and you'll see in my translation of English I've still got that word item now that says it's going into the same account as the entry above it but you notice it's in the same paragraph it's not being put below it it's just running on so the structure is not as we would expect and it's not as clear as we would expect but it's nevertheless complete and it says, so diaveri, which means credit. And then SOL dot, well that's an abbreviation for soldi. And then you've got XLIIJ. Now they put the J on the last I. So the J is just an I with a tail on it, which indicates this is the last one. So that's 43. Soldi, uh, per Michele, 
Fia Galeti. The F stands for Fia, which is son of Galeti. And you've got a colon. Levamo di ragioni dolos quinquato mineti. Which means we posted this from uh, the account of the stutterer Mineti for Michele. It's quite complicated what happened there, but basically, um, Orlando would 26 uh, lady, which had been lent. And someone was repaid by Michele, son of Galetti, by transferring, debiting the account of Minetti. And he'd have had the necessary documentation with him to do that. If we go on to the next entry, just talk you very briefly through it. You see there the extra detail that they put in. So you've got the debit at the top. You've got the name of the account, the debit, the amount, uh, the name of the second account and the fact it was going to be credited. And then you get an explanation, which at that point in time was very important, uh, just to give an extra, to have extra ammunition in the event of a dispute. This is what he wanted it for. So we lent him for it so he could do this. Then you got the second entry, which is another uh, loan. In this case, uh, Apollonio, a, a borrowed 35 soldi for denarii to give a gypsy with some linen cloths. So we paid the gypsy on behalf of Apollonio, or we given him the cash to pay the gypsy. And then you've got the start of a repayment. Dear Vieri, Apollonia, Dear Vieri, uh, 21 soldi, less one denarii, so that's 20 soldi, 11 denarii. Then you've got the debit to the account of someone else. So this is a bank transfer. It's offset. And then you have uh, Apollonia, Dear Vieri, credit, so it's another receipt. And this time, Apollonio gave five sold it to Arnolfino who gave it to us so it's cash it's going to be debited and then the final one which actually mentions Apollonio credit for 17.5 from his hand so he handed cash so cash is debit the next two uh, you've got Ristoro and Jacopino, who are jointly liable. So two people between them. So it's this partnership, if you like. And they've received cash. And you can see how much interest they're going to pay. 16 denarii per libra. When they're due to pay it. What the, inter what the interest will be. as long as we permit. So it's, it's just a note of the loan that was made with witnesses. And then you have a, a, an additional charge, this time for interest. And then you, you get some repayment. So Restoro has repaid some of it on behalf of them both, obviously. And he's handed over 40 soldi in cash, just two lira, two liri. And he's given it to Tegiayo to pass it to you, assuming you're the banker. And then you get another credit. This time it's from someone else, Dadaletto, for them, in cash. And at the end there you get an example of the way that dates were done in those days. With a, you've counted the first half of the month forwards, so the January the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, but from the end of the month you count it backwards. Uh, so you'd say uh, three days before the end of the month.
And the fourth one, Shiradu, is debited for 20 sold to 10 denarii. Uh, for Buglini, son of Teresi, is a credit. Teresa was a debtor from this in the previous ledger. So what's happened here is that Traverso had a debit balance in the previous ledger. Gerardo has now taken over that debt. So he's now debited and means that Biolini will be credited with it and his balance will be erased. So again, that's another example of offset, book transfer. Pastorin Petto was lent 20 soldi in cash, uh, signed for, and then repaid it by deducting it um, from his creditor account. Now, the way that works is that in those days, in that period, uh, if you deposited money, an account was opened for you as a creditor. If you were lent money, an account was offered for you as a debtor, and you could have both types. How could you have both types, you might ask? Well, remember that in this period there wasn't enough cash, so people were making payments using credit. And what would often happen would be that someone that you'd lent money to will be paid by someone else through the bank. So when the third person makes a payment, the second person gets a new account open as a credit. And that's what happened here. When Aquida, Forestani, made a payment to Maneto through the bank. And that gave Maneto a credit balance in the banker's ledger, which could be used to eliminate the debit balance. So the 20 soldi was transferred from that credit account into the debit account. The sixth item um, is for Massa Buntini, who's for coins. So there's two coins. So it's a debit to Alberto. So the two coins were handed out, but it was charged at 22 soldi for denarii. That was what they were worth. And there's a credit to cash, because the bank's cash has gone down. And then the next entry is a repayment on behalf of Alberto from Ubertino's creditor account. So it's similar to the previous entry, but it's it's uh, it's very similar to previous entry, and here you have an indication of where the contra entry was made, three parchments after this, because the pages weren't numbered; they just said three parchments after this. And that tells us, among other things, that these sheets of parchment that have survived the two sheets that uh, Jeffrey Lee described in the article you read were in a, at some point, they were bound together in a book. Crispino Attilianti, the, the final account here, again, it's like an earlier account where there's mention of a previous ledger. Uh, so this, this person's been debited with 100 soldi. And his previous end, his previous account, the account in the previous ledger has been credited. And why is that? Well, because we lent the money, the bank lent Crispino money in the period covered by the previous ledger that's still not been repaid, so we pushed it, opened a new account in this ledger for that. And that tells us that at that time, there was no system had been developed that simplified the transference of balances between old and new ledgers. That they actually had them both open at the same time. And to simplify things in this case, they moved 
they cleared off the balance by moving it in the old edge of moving it into the new one, but in the earlier example they didn't. And then you get a credit, uh, which is partly paying it back. And they were partly paid back in English pennies, which meant that three pounds and twenty one denarii were the value placed on those pennies and other coins. So it means that the bank received cash, which is a debit. And then you've got one, another example of a transfer from a creditor account. So those are those brief discussion outline of what's in there. Now what that tells you is that looking at all those, this is a very basic double entry system. It's It's been developed to the point where the debits and the credits are all there. The amounts are clear. This, the signposting to other evidence is in there. The witnesses, the documents, and so on and so forth. The reasons are given in certain places. But the layout, which you can't tell from this, but you can from Santini's, um, except from Santini that I showed you the transcription. It's not sophisticated. It's not developed to the point where things are all in the right place. But many of them are, but they're not all in them. And the, the most obvious example of that is the fact that the second entry just runs on after the first. There's no separation onto a new line or thing like that. Okay, other things that you'll have heard about in the reading that you had for this week were the fairs of northern, northeastern Italy, which are fundamental to the development of, of banking across uh, northern Italy and also uh, the uh, development of or the diffusion of double entry, the method that was used by the bankers from Florence in Bologna, um, the diffusion of that method across the rest of uh, northeast Italy through the, the regional fairs. I won't go into the, the reasons how that came about other than to say, well, here are the fairs. And there were eight fairs and they just travelled around them over the course of the year. And people came from all across northern Italy to attend. From there, we, we then progressed to looking at uh, the Champagne Fairs. And this is from 1164. You can see Champagne, the county of Champagne, up on the, in the top right. You see Troy, which was one of the locations for the, the fairs, the main fairs. And you saw in the paper when they took place and all the rest of it. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see the county of Toulouse and to the right uh, where Nîmes is. And if you follow the coast around, you come to Italy. If you go, instead of that, if you go back in the county of uh, Toulouse and you go to Carcassonne and travel south, you come into Spain. And the merchants going to Champagne would either travel a bit further north to get into France and then make their way up or they would enter through the county of Toulouse and move the way north from there. And one thing that you will have read in the articles was that there was a safe passage edict passed by the King of France and before him the County of Champagne which allowed safe passage through the whole of France. So this, as soon as someone set foot in, Fran in France, uh, they were covered by that. But if you look carefully at where the French border is, you'll see that it's actually shown there as outside the county of Toulouse. The thick blue shadow around the outside of the map. That would be the territory covered by the, the protection of the King of France. So it didn't matter when where you came in, but once you crossed that line, you 
were under protection to get to the fairs of Champagne. If you uh, think about that for a minute, the, share, the fairs were all year round. One of the fairs opened on the 2nd of January. The weather and the cloths that were being sold, spices that were being sold that had to be kept dry. Think about how difficult that must have been. And actually keeping a record written on parchment or when it was available paper. It's a, a, a challenge. I wanted to be addressed and overcome. So for someone to actually keep a record, they had to have great motivation for doing it. The final uh, slide, just to, to wrap things up for today. This is from the Finney uh, ledger. Fair Ledger of 1296 1305 Champagne, confirming that double entry was in use at the Champagne Fairs. There's very little doubt that double entry was in use in the Champagne Fairs almost from the beginning. Of Italian involvement, and certainly from the 1220s when the CNEs were uh, running the banking. If you can see there that the end of each of the entries, it tells you um, and the, where it's going to for the contra entry. Now this is this is a fairly clear example of double entry. Compare that to the double entries relating to the banker's ledger from 1211. It was much less clear. There's also some additional information in this. these, but arguably not as much as there was in 1211, which suggests that the way that everything was organised was becoming more um, streamlined, that evidence was better organised and kept in a place that could easily be identified and there was maybe less need to be very specific about what evidence there was. Or it may just be that this is the way the bookkeeper did it. We don't know. But we do know for sure that in 1296 they were using double entry bookkeeping at the fairs of Champagne. <laughs>